Welcome to the world of material science. My name is Professor Bonnet. In this video, we will first of all show an overview of the different heat treatment processes and then we will also get to know the first two annealing processes in detail. The material condition in which steel components and tools are produced and processed rarely immediately fulfill the requirements arising from the intended use. It is therefore necessary to modify the material condition by heat treatment in such a way that, for example, the hardness, strength, toughness or wear resistance are optimally adapted to the different conditions of the respective application. This also allows the, the relationship between the capacity to withstand stresses, component geometry and dimensions to be optimized. This means that the safety against failure is increased or the dimension can be reduced while maintaining the same level of safety. Heat treatment is defined as to subject a workpiece in whole or in part to time temperature sequences in order to bring about a change in its properties and or its microstructure. If necessary, the chemical composition of the material can be changed during the treatment. The initial microstructure is transformed into the new microstructure with the desired properties by rearrangement, insertion or separation of particles. Thus, a change in structure is achieved by rearrangement in the lattice during annealing, tempering, hardening and curing. By the insertion of particles during carburizing or nitriding, or by segregation during decarburization, to name only the most important ones. These processes can be classified into groups according to their differences. Thermal processes, thermomechanical processes and thermochemical processes. Here we see an overview of the common treatment processes and depending on the aim of the heat treatment there are several different processes to choose from. In some processes, the material condition is changed specifically over the entire cross-section, such as during annealing, hardening, tampering, quenching and tempering or binitizing. In other processes, only a change of the surface layer is intended, such as in surface hardening, nitriding or nitrocarburizing. In some processes, although the surface layer is deliberately changed, the condition of the material is also influenced in the entire cross-section. This applies, for example, to case hardening or the diffusion treatments chromium plating and boriding. In the figure shown, we can see that the different thermal and thermochemical heat treatment processes are divided into four groups. In the following we will look at the most important annealing processes. We will limit ourselves to diffusion annealing, normalizing, soft annealing, stress relief annealing and recrystallization annealing. In this video we will first take a closer look at the first two annealing processes. Heat treatment is carried out in three steps. Heating, holding and cooling. T H E is the heating time. Here the workpiece is heated continuously to capital T H O. T H E consists of T B, the heating time in which the boundary zone reaches capital T H O, and T S, the soak time in which the core zone reaches capital T H O. T H O is the holding time. Here the microstructure is homogenized. Tc is the cooling time. The exact temperature levels for capital THO and the holding times THO depend on the desired process on the one hand, but of course also on the carbon content of the steel to be heat treated. For this purpose we must once again recall the temperature range of the Ausnite transformation relevant for heat treatment in the metastable iron carbon phase diagram which we already discussed in detail in an earlier video. 
And remember which structural transformations take place when the various phase boundaries are undercut or exceeded. When falling below the GSK line, body-centered cubic ferrite is precipitated. Conversely, when exceeding the GSK line, austenite is formed from the ferrite. If the PSK line is undercut, the eutectoite structure perlite is formed, consisting of finely striped ferrite and cementite. If the PSK line is exceeded, the perlite dissolves again. For hyperperlitic steel, the transformation at the ES line can also be of interest. If the transformation is below the ES line, cementite precipitation occurs preferably at the grain boundaries. And it, if it is above the ES line, this is referred to as cementite deformation. Depending on the annealing process, different microstructural transformations are aimed at, so that very different temperature levels are obtained for the individual processes. In order for the diffusion processes necessary for diffusion annealing can take place at all in finite time, this annealing process is carried out at a maximum temperature of over 1100 degrees Celsius. In normalizing, the perlite dissolution is necessary so that the annealing temperatures here are slightly above the GSK line. In soft annealing, a specific thermodynamically induced transformation of the cementite is required, which takes place in the vicinity of the GSK line. Stress relief annealing can be carried out at significantly lower temperatures. And recrystallization annealing at even lower temperatures between 550 and 700 degrees Celsius. depending on the exact steel type and the degree of preforming. However, we would like to discuss the purpose and implementation of the various annealing processes in detail. Diffusion annealing is intended to eliminate differences in concentration of the accompanying elements, for example segregations, especially of sulfur, phosphor, carbon and manganese. Basically, all atoms strive to distribute themselves evenly in the basic substance iron if the temperature and time are sufficient for diffusion. Therefore, bows are set as high as possible. The process is used in a wide variety of applications, but especially for free cutting steel and cast steel. The temperatures during diffusion annealing are up to just below the solidus line. Thus, at 1100 to 1300 degrees Celsius, depending on the carbon content of the steel. The holding time ranges from several hours up to 40 hours, depending on the wall thickness of the workpiece. These figures show the enormous positive influence of diffusion annealing on the mechanical properties, using the example of the hot working steel X38 CRMOV. 5.1. Determine both at the edge and in the core of the sample. In the graph on the left, we can see that the tensile strength is slightly increased. More important, however, is a positive influence on the toughness of the material, expressed here by the reduction of the area after fracture, which was increased by up to more than 100% in the core of the workpiece. The necking that describes the percentage change of the cross-section after the break as U 
in relation to the initial cross-sectional area S0. However, this method also has some disadvantages. Grain cursing can occur. However, this could be eliminated by a subsequent normalizing. And there is a risk of scaling and decarburization due to the high annealing temperatures. And it is quite expensive due to the high amount of energy required. The normalizing is to adjust a fine-grained and uniform structure which combines the best strength and toughness characteristics, the normal structure. The original abnormal microstructure may have arisen in particular with large forgings, well joints, sheet metal that has cooled relatively slowly and is therefore coarse-grained, and with cast steel parts. Normalizing is mainly used for unalloyed steel or cast steel in order to bring the microstructures that are uncontrollably formed during processing, casting or hot forming, to a standard level. During slow cooling from the gamma region, the gamma alpha transformation normally occurs at the grain boundaries of gamma crystals. If a coarse austenitic grain is formed after cooling at an elevated temperature or long holding time and a high cooling rate is present, the gamma alpha transformation can also occur inside the grains. The resulting microstructure is called Wittmannstedt's structure or overheating microstructure. Here we can see the metallographic image of such a Wittmannstedt structure in the area of the heat affected zone after a repair weld. A microstructure in Wittmannstedt's arrangement is more brittle than a normally formed ferritic polytic microstructure or a polytic microstructure with grain boundary cementite. For example, so that normalizing significantly increases toughness. As we have already seen, hypopolytic steel specimens with up to 0.8% carbon are heated to a temperature 30 to 50 degrees Celsius above the GSK line in the iron carbon diagram, thus depending on the carbon content to 750 to 950 degrees Celsius, held for a few hours and then cooled in the air. The result is a fine-grained ferritic polytic structure. Hyperpolytic steel samples with more than 0.8% carbon are not annealed in the austenite region, but only just above the PSK line at approximately 750 degrees Celsius. As a result, the coarse cementite on the grain boundaries is also transformed. Modern rolling mills offer the possibility of adjusting the roll temperatures and cooling so that normal annealing can be replaced by this rolling with controlled temperature control. These are then referred to as normalizing rolled steel samples. Normalizing improves all the impact energy responsible for brittle fracture behavior. The transition temperature is also shifted toward lower temperatures. The disadvantage is that this annealing process is not possible with transformation-free, for example, pure ferritic or pure arsenitic steel workpieces. Thanks for watching. In the next video, we will learn about further heat treatment processes for steel. If you are new here, consider hitting the subscribe button. New videos on material science that you might be interested in are regularly added.